On the Universal Basic Income Team, or Team UBI, we'll be calling them, we have Christine Kidd, hailing from Vermont. Christine currently serves as a project leader with Delivery Associates. She spent most of her career serving the social sector, which includes state agencies, community-based organizations, public schools, and most recently, she served as a senior leader at the Center for Employment Opportunities, a national nonprofit focused on re-entry and workforce development. Christine's partner today is Scott Santens, hailing from Washington, D.C. Scott is the founder of Income to Support All Foundation. Yes, that URL is, it's a foundation.org. He's the editor of Basic Income Today, a daily UBI news hub, and just dropped episode six of the Basic Income Show on YouTube a few days ago. Go check it out. Scott is also the author of Let There Be Money. In our public debate, we are also very fortunate to have an esteemed uh, panel of judges. We have Bill Hughes, CEO of Ed Design Lab, where he and his team are working tirelessly and partnering to design solutions for new majority learners. We also have Ethan Pollack, our senior director with JFF's policy team, where he leads the Financing the Future initiative, which explores new approaches to financing post-secondary education. And we have Nordia Savage, a second time judge for JFF and Tech Duels. Nordia has held roles in philanthropy, public policy, cross-sector solutions, all in the name of eliminating barriers for individuals in their earn to learn journey. And last but not least, we have Justin Pulley. Justin is a senior at Catholic University where he's pursuing a degree in electrical engineering. Debaters and judges, thank you so much for sharing your time, your insights, and hopefully your energy as we go forward. Now, let me explain the debate format. In round one, our first pair of debaters from Team UBE and Team UBI will have four minutes to deliver their opening constructive speeches. Following the constructive speeches, our second pair of debaters will also have four minutes to refute arguments presented in the constructive speech. These will be the rebuttal speeches. In round two, our, judge, our judges will have the opportunity to ask a question for both teams to answer. Each will have one minute to respond to each of our judges' questions. In our final round, each team will have two minutes to present their final arguments to the judges and the audience. And then our judges will vote to determine our winning team. And you, the audience, will have an opportunity to vote for your most valuable debater, the MVD award at the end of the debate. So please have your phones ready to capture our QR code. Now, are you ready to debate? We'll begin with our public, uh, our, our winners of the coin toss, which was Team UBE. They'll begin their constructive speech. Hello everyone, my name is Devin Cotton. Universal basic employment is the bipartisan solution to eliminate poverty and relieve government of its direct and indirect costs while restoring agency and dignity back to the millions of Americans. UBE reimagines a world where a single mother with two kids who has historically been discouraged due to work, due to the benefits cliff, lost her personal dignity as she repeatedly gone through the public benefits recertification process and worries daily about the future of her children as they grow up in a languishing neighborhood void of opportunity and resources to a world where she can walk to work at her local church, childcare center, grocery store, or Main Street business and earn an autonomous wage of $50,000 if she were to live in a city like Cleveland, Ohio, and walk back up the street to a home that she owns in a neighborhood of choice because her $50,000 salary allows her to use the private sector banking tools like a mortgage, credit card, and car loan to navigate her needs and wants. Additionally, her $50,000 salary sends the requisite signals to the private sector to solve the symptoms of poverty like food access, digital divide, and access to banking. Our opposition will articulate how UBI has impacts on stress, health outcomes, and community connections, all substantial claims. But we asked them to examine if a basic income from the government improves agency and dignity, particularly for our most vulnerable workers. Does a basic income widen the income and wealth gap, further concern, uh, concentrating poverty in black and brown communities? And if there is enough support from both parties to make UBI a reality? Or should there be a greater focus on UBE, a bipartisan solution that restores dignity and agency to the millions of low wage worker signals investments from the private sector to rebuild communities and has the political appeal to be realized in our lifetime. Thanks. Thank you. And now we'll bring up Team UBI to begin their constructive speech.
Good afternoon and thank you for having us. Universal basic income defined as a periodic cash payment unconditionally delivered to all on an individual basis without means test or work requirement is the economic foundation that we need to build a more resilient economy, workforce, and society. First, let's remember what happens when we lack that basic income. Our physical health, our mental health, our cognitive function, and our social connections all suffer. And studies prove that this is causal. It's not that flawed people lack income, it's that everything else held equal, being economically insecure or short on money is harmful to us. And we need to reduce this suffering and help people flourish. So why do we believe that UBI is the lever of choice? We'll posit three main arguments. First, we argue that UBI is a primary foundational policy that supports and strengthens other policies like education, healthcare, and all forms of work. UBI pilots have revealed that we show up better in our lives with the grounding of a steady, unconditional income. We're better, more engaged workers, we're better students, parents, and humans. The universal in UBI is a critical strength of this effort. It reaches and empowers everyone and excludes no one. Second, we look as we look ahead to the future, we can no longer rely on jobs to deliver that steady income. We've seen this in the emergence of the gig economy and workers should expect an even more volatile relationship with employment as AI-driven automation phases out entire skill sets and erodes wages. In the past, we've attempted to address this challenge with safety nets like unemployment insurance, but those nets are fraying and we need a universal broad-based solution. And third, as interventions go, UBI is simple. We know how to get dollars into people's pockets and our government does this quite effectively with really low overhead in programs like social security where we have a, ha a half a percentage point overhead rate. So this is a tiny sliver of the bureaucracy it takes to administer a more complex or means tested program like universal employment that our counterparts have described. And they've argued that universal employment is more politically palatable and empowering for communities, and we're prepared to counter those arguments and other claims as well. And further, we believe that UBI is a significantly stronger policy than universal employment. First, our government's ability to administer universal employment is untested, and much of the value proposition lies in linking that guaranteed job to strong training. But the evidence behind training programs in the US has been pretty weak. So one study compared how people fared after receiving UBI compared to other people who received UBI plus skills training. And those who got the additional skills training actually ended up worse off than people who just got the cash and were able to do what they wanted with it. And a study of 93 World Bank programs over the course of a decade found that the training programs had little impact on poverty or stability, especially when you took into account program cost. And in contrast, injections of capital, like cash, goods, or livestock, uh, seem to stimulate self-employment and raise long-term earning potential. A jobs guarantee also doesn't help people who already have a job or whose work isn't recognized as valid employment. For working people, the main impact of automation is likely going to be downward pressure on wages, not, all, not outright job loss. So UBI can help them, but a jobs guarantee will not. And a whole other subset of people are not able to engage with employment due to disabilities, caregiving responsibilities, or other barriers to employment. And this would not, and they would not benefit from universal employment, but they would benefit from UBI. And last, the overhead and infrastructure required to run a universal jobs program is immense, especially in comparison to the low overhead of UBI. So this overhead applies to the government or social sector, and it also applies to workers themselves who have to carry the additional expense and, law and opportunity cost of engaging in employment. So with that in mind, as we consider the two sides of this debate, our counterparts must prove not only that a jobs guarantee is superior to UBI, but that it is far, far superior to UBI because of all of the additional overhead that it would be required, that would be required in order to, to implement the policy successfully. Thank you very much. Impressive, both under four minutes, wow. All right, so we will now transition uh, from our constructive speeches into rebuttal speeches. And in this round, our second speakers will respond to the arguments that were introduced in the constructive speech. We'll start this rebuttal with Dr. Lisa Herring from, the, from Team UBE. Lisa. Thank you. So you heard earlier from my colleague, reimagine a world, livable income, $50,000 salary, home ownership, access to car loans, food access, quality of life, perhaps most importantly, agency and, di and dignity for the most vulnerable, vulnerable and bipartisan solution. Whereas we will debate today on many of these issues, it is critical to note the power of UBE versus UBI. 
guaranteed jobs versus cash handouts. UBE ensures dignity and purpose through meaningful work, and UBI only provides financial support. Our counterparts have identified certain areas of concern, such as UBI provides physical and mental health access and support, but what about purpose and talent opportunities? Talent for those, whether employed or unemployed, this is where UBE makes a significant difference. It reduces income inequality through work and not just cash. By providing jobs that pay wages, UBE directly tackles inequality, ensures everyone is contributing to society in a meaningful way. And this is critically important. Additionally, in a community, especially now and moving ahead, we must be thoughtful about how we can create economic stability and resilience, particularly during times of economic downturns. UBE would be a counter cyclical stabilizer and this we know. To that end, we continue to enforce that, yes, this is much more impactful. It is also critically important to align it with education. So whether formally educated or not, UBE provides the training that is needed that then not only strengthens the individual, but strengthens the community. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, now we'll <clears throat> turn it back over to the UBI team. Scott? Hi, everyone. So in regards to the claim that paychecks are the gold standard for meeting wants and needs with agency, income is the gold standard for agency, and that is not to be confused with jobs. The wealthy have no issue at all receiving dividends for owning stock and interest for having savings or rent for owning land. No one has more agency than those with wealth, and it's not because they have a job. It's because they have money. Anyone with a job can lose that job, and thus their income at any time. That breeds insecurity and empowers abuse of employers. UBI recognizes that and is always there for everyone. A UBE job is not going to be what most people who lose their jobs want. UBI will be there for those people as they seek their next job. It's cash that is the gold standard for poverty reduction. Poverty is mostly a non-worker issue, but not in the way people think. Half the, US work, half the US doesn't work a job. That's not because half refuse to get a job or can't find one. Children, the elderly, the disabled, and students make up 86% of non-workers, including unpaid carers makes it 94%. A job won't help any of them. UBI will help all of them. As for UBE subsidizing people, places, and businesses, UBI subsidizes all work in all its forms, paid and unpaid. UBE does not. UBE offers a very limited range of work options. Not all jobs make sense as UBE jobs and unpaid work makes no sense for UBE. Meanwhile, UBI pilots consistently show large increases in entrepreneurship because so many people just need capital and reduced risk to start a new business. And they also need customers with money to spend. UBI helps with all three. One of the results from Sam Altman's big recent basic income pilot was a 26% increase in entrepreneurship for black participants compared to the control group and a 15% increase for women. Bipartisanship is a good argument in general, but it's not a good argument to use against UBI, which is fully bipartisan. UBI has been supported by Milton Friedman and Dr. King and Friedrich Hayek and David Graeber. It's cash to spend in private markets. It's not socialism. It's about the means of consumption instead of the means of production. It's also a recognition of human rights. It's about the means to exist regardless of who you are or what you believe or do. It's the freedom to live and be. How does UBI give people agency and power? UBI is all about agency. It trusts people to make the decisions that are best for them. It trusts people with ownership of their time. Saying UBI doesn't give agency is like saying seniors don't have agency with Social Security. Saying seniors are disempowered by their monthly checks also ignores how much political power seniors have. Why do they have such power? It comes from being more politically engaged because they have more skin in the game and they have more time to spend being civically engaged. The unconditionality of UBI is power. It's the power to say no. It's the power to refuse low wages and bad work conditions and harmful work. Nothing would empower unions more than UBI functioning as a universal permanent strike fund. UBI pilots consistently show victims of abuse leaving their abusers. That's power and agency. When it comes to political will, I think automation will increase the will for UBI more than UBE because if work is being done by machines, 
Why make up jobs for humans to prove their worth instead of acknowledging our inherent worth and seeing technology as an inheritance that should provide a dividend to us all in the form of money and its ability to purchase time, especially when our data trained AI? We also witnessed during the pandemic how quickly the political will to send people money happened during a, a time of mass unemployment. We will see it again. The stimulus checks were extremely popular on both sides. Trump even put his name on them. Finally, UBI is quite different than existing safety nets, which exclude so many people and trap so many in poverty as an inherent outcome of means testing and targeting over universality. UBI, by reaching everyone without conditions, provides unconditional access to resources, capital, and customers. It enables more geographic mobility. Evidence from UBI pilots consistently shows stronger communities. UBI is literally the act of investing in everyone everywhere. Thank you. Scott, I was just about to get you on the time. <laughs> All right. So someone just pinged me on the side asking about jobs uh, and entrepreneurship. And I just want to say, as we talk about jobs, we do include entrepreneurship as a career. Sometimes the best quality or good job is a job that you might create for yourself or others. So I just want to uh, acknowledge that. So now we're going to open it up, judges, for your questions. Uh, ask that you speak clearly and slowly as you state your question to the debaters. Um, who wants to start? Bill Hughes, I'll call on you. Okay, I'll start. Um, I'd like you to consider something and then ask answer a specific question. First of all, great arguments for both teams. Um, thinking about not just the current state, but also the state of things to come, um, possibly significant inflation in the cost of basic goods, um, dramatic shifts in the types of jobs and what they mean in society. The question is, what's the weakest part of your argument and why is it better than the alternative? Bill, that's like a southpaw punch right there. <laughs> and which team wants to jump in? I'll start. Uh, our, our opponents suggest that uh, two things that I think are important to name, and given the question, what's the weakest part of our, our, our argument, uh, our, our opponent states that UBI pilots the opportunity for entrepreneurship. And we are all in agreement that entrepreneurship now more than ever before is critical. But without skills and training and the ability to have the knowledge, then it becomes for naught. So contrary to what UBI positions, UBE provides that level of opportunity. The reference to, and so perhaps if it is anchored that entrepreneurship is one of the weaker considerations, I would argue that training will forever exist. Education is a critical component, and now more than ever, there are new and creative ways for us to provide that training, not just to the traditional, not just to the traditional model. A great example would be the also use of AI, recognizing that we don't want to just be consumers, and where AI may consume jobs in the future, we don't want to be consumers, but co-creators. To that end, universal basic employment provides can provide opportunities, again, for the training that allows for that. And finally, the statement regarding the stimulus checks previously named, if they were recipients, if we were recipients back during the, the COVID stimulus checks and still find ourselves challenged, then that was not the universal solution. Thank you. How about Tim UBI? Uh, so when you're asking this, you're saying what is the weakest of the of the arguments that the other team made? No, that you uh, weakest or that we made about the other your team. Your position, yeah. What's what's the what's the the weakness of your position? Every position has a weakness. Um, so what's yours, and why is it better than the alternative? Um, I would say in regards to this the details of this particular debate that the weakest for UBI is just acknowledging that um, when it comes to political realities, that people just in general believe that you should get a job. So, you know, that's what, it's a common phrase, go get a job, go get a job. I don't care if you're in poverty, go get a job. So UBE 
leans into that and it says, yeah, you're right. You know, there should be no unconditional right to live. You have to earn it. So you should get a job. And I, I admit that in regards to UBI, that um, is a is a tougher hill for us to climb. But I do think that um, as time goes on and as automation uh, progresses and advances, the arguments for UBI only grow stronger. Great, thank you for that. Ethan, we'll go to you for the next question. Hi. Um, so with Trump's recent win and um, the Republicans taking control of Congress, I think it's useful to kind of stress test some of these proposals against some of their main conservative critiques. So I'm, I'm curious, for Team UBI, I'm curious how you'd respond to concerns that UBI might decenter the concept of work and create a societal divide between those who work and those who don't. And for Team UBE, how would you respond to more conservative critiques that the government custom designing tens of millions of jobs might be too much government interference uh, in the composition of the, or maybe not interference, but intervention in the composition of the economy. Thank you. Uh, can I answer first to that? Go for it. Okay. Um, I would say that there's a there's a common misconception, misconception about UBI that it's meant to be a replacement for work, and it's not that. Uh, what we most what we saw most recently that is a good kind of uh, example of what UBI is, is the child tax credit, which reduced child poverty by over 40%. And that was averaging about $430 per household per month. That's clearly not enough to live and like not have a job, uh, but it is enough to actually help people find work and to actually boost the total incomes after work and just really just help people with uh, reduction of poverty and reduction of insecurity. And um, I think that uh, this this it should be seen as more of like a dividend and something that aids um, in addition to income. So like when you're comparing it to a 50k UBE job, like yeah, it's it's not the it's not that that is a job replacement, another job. But this is an income floor that's underneath everything at all times, and I think that's really important. Yeah, and so Ethan, thanks for the question. And in the question around UBE is not a solution. It's an adaptation on the job guarantee solution that would have the government add somewhere around 10 to $15 million, uh, 15 million jobs that ebb and flow with the needs of the economy. UBE uses the existing uh, government and business investment appetite to subsidize private jobs and send money to private businesses that allows folks, uh, particularly Main Street businesses, um, that allow folks to have meaningful employment in their own community so that they can walk to work at their local church. What would our world look like that someone could go make $50,000 at their local church or community garden and have enough money to be an actor in changing the way that their community looks at an active pace? Again, our government does a really, really good job of sending money to private businesses. So why don't we just use that appetite and, and affinity to subsidize people by way of work? Ethan, do those answer your question? Yes, definitely. Those are great answers. Thank you. Perfect, perfect. All right, Nordia, do you have a question that you'd like to share? Sure. Um, thank you all. Um, quick question. Um, what do you think the role of private sector um, would play in either of your strategies? Uh, do you want me to go first again? I can do that. Uh, so private sector, the, the beauty of, of UBI is that it is cash to spend in private markets. And it's, so as we mentioned in um, both the statement and rebuttal, that that's why it's so valuable to entrepreneurship. Uh, like so many people start up businesses and those businesses could have succeeded if maybe they had customers with money to spend. So it's not only about uh, getting people capital and encouraging people to start businesses, but you've got to have people with money to spend. UBI actually leans into that and it fuels markets. And um, I think that's a reason, you know, it helps with political viability with businesses um, who acknowledge the increase in, in the consumer's uh, base that would actually like UBI, knowing that the people would have more money to spend 
at those businesses and small businesses could succeed, especially at the local level, especially in like small town USA that is, um, you know, so dried up economically. So I'm going to link the two questions together, Nordia, and the one that Ethan posed. Again, it, the private sector plays a significant role in two ways for UBE. One, again, subsidizing those Main Street jobs that you see um, that would, you know, provide a direct resources to, to private Main Street small businesses to hire the most vulnerable workers and learners that may not be able to find an opportunity at a larger company that has more robust HR requirements um, so that we could have individuals with lower soft skills that may have a felonious background to be able to go work again in their community to learn the skills needed to get to another private opportunity. So that's the first aspect that the private sector plays in as well. And we'll leave enough time for, for my, my, peer, uh, my friend Lisa to jump in as well. And then secondly, the private sector plays uh, a, another role in being able to see the signals of an earned income and to provide um, out of their own, you know, goals and advantageousness to to make enough money. Um, I think one of the critical differences between a UBI and an earned income is that an earned can, earned income the private sector sees. Um, right now, we have a, a millions of dollars going into I'm sorry, billions of dollars going into an investments like SNAP. HUD and different things like that, but our private sectors don't recognize those money. How would the private sector recognize the UBI dollars? Um, I think we haven't seen those dollars in the pilots that we've seen run around the uh, run around the country. Over 100 pilots, we haven't seen those dollars translate to the private sector from a from a way of an, uh, insulating investment to the solve the symptoms of poverty. Thank you, Devin. And I just want to add to, to what my colleague, my partner has also shared as it relates to the private sector. There's the opportunity for increased consumer spending, which we believe with guaranteed employment, people will have disposable income and that allows for potential benefit uh, to the private sector. Additionally, it provides access to a more diverse and qualified pool of applicants by virtue of uh, the training and skills that are available through UBE. And I think that's important to call out. And then finally, just for the uh, other consideration, there is also the opportunity to promote social responsibility. And for the private sector, where so, so, so social responsibility tends to be a top of mind area and endeavor, it helps to promote not only opportunity, but private companies may very well engage as well. I think those are some of the key factors in addition to what you've heard my colleagues say that we should consider in that space. Excellent, excellent. I'm gonna do something we haven't done in a debate. I'm gonna ask each team if you have a question for one another, you can ask that now. Uh, sure, I have a question for the other team. Um, so first of all, I, I, I'm kind of surprised that you're, you're pitching $50,000 per job. Um, that's clearly um, going to be very expensive, especially if you're looking at, you said 10 to 15 million uh, people potentially. I think it'd probably be more like 20 million people or more who would want a 50K job. So that's uh, very expensive. Um, but what do you think about the potential of crowding out? So of uh, people in a job somewhere, let's say they're working in the private sector, they, if they're employed, they're earning like 35K, and um, then this other job, the UBE job uh, is 50K and, and competes directly against that job. And it may even be doing like the same thing. So maybe it's like a teacher moving from being a teacher to being a teacher. Um, what do you say about that kind of crowding out argument with that amount of money? I'll start off and I'll again, leave time for my, my friend, Lisa. Uh, I, I, I don't see it as a crowding. Out. Thanks for the question, uh, Scott. But I don't see it as a crowding out. I see it more so as creating an economic floor. Uh, the fifty thousand dollar number comes from the Atlanta Federal Reserve benefit calculator, which UBE is standing up an autonomous wage. So if you use the Atlanta Federal Reserve benefit calculator um, in every single co uh, county in the country, they've mapped out what the number would mean to get to a point where you surpass the use of social safety net benefits. So. That is where that number comes from. Um, again, that number in Philadelphia is eighty-three thousand dollars. The number in Columbus is closer to fifty-six thousand um, dollars. But what we're doing is setting like an, an economic floor because wages overall in the country are are, are low. 
Uh, we've seen wage, st wage stagnation since the 1980s. And so we need to create, an, uh, uh, we've seen this done in economics in, in multiple times where you create a floor and the market corrects itself. So our teachers don't make enough. Um, our janitorial environmental staff workers don't make enough. Our, our certified nursing assistant home health aides don't make enough. And so if we create a main street solution where folks can have enough, what does the market and how does the market correct itself in that way? I'll just add to my colleague the consideration for the current unemployment rate, uh, which as of last month, October 2024, was at 4.1%, which is an average of about 7 million unemployed people. And if we were to just take the components of what we're talking about even now, and we think about an average salary of 50000 I don't think by any means that that is um, um, uh, more more than enough uh, to the point around us uh, maxing out or overcrowding for individuals to have a substantial livelihood. 50000 is not only a realistic salary, but there is even greater demand when we think about what it takes for one to sustain his or herself or family, if that's an individual that is also responsible for a household. To this end, UBE provides for a very substantial need that allows for individuals to have a livable wage and a quality of life. And if that provides an opportunity for shift and change, then that also is not a, that is not a negative, but provides an opportunity for those to find the best fit for themselves. I think that needs to be anchored in this, in this conversation as it relates to the question that's been asked. Can I add a part B? Well, it's not a further reply. It's not a, it's not a reply to your reply, but it's also a second part. Well, Scott, <laughs> Scott, let's hang, hang on to that. Um, uh, Dr. Herring or Devin, do you have a question at all for the U UBI team? Okay. Oh, okay. Are you going, Dr. Herring, or do you want me to go? You can go. Okay. Um, I think one of the things I really struggle with UBI, as I think about in, uh, as a person from Cleveland that does a lot of this work in our most disinvested communities, um, our, we have an extremely vulnerable neighborhood on our east side that makes in, that has an average income of $9,000. We've seen the UBI pilots at five, $500 a month. Let's just use that as the average. Uh, $500 a month is um, pushes those folks to $15,000 in uh, uh income of access, you know what I mean? Dollars that they have available to. $9,000 and $15,000 are both destined to poverty. How is UBI a true solution to not only give folks agency um, to pull, to get themselves out of poverty? Um, and then additionally, how does UBI give the opportunity to change the way those communities look, um, how to change the way those communities look? The quality of life that those individuals experience every single day. Um, again, so many of our workers and learners are, are, are trying to make it work on $500 a month today. Um, it's the symptoms that we're trying to solve right now. So how does this work? Yeah. And I think thinking about a solution that's in complement to work, why wouldn't we just invest in work? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, can I, I would, Christine, can I just start with this one and then uh, please come in to um, I just want to add that the the pilots going on that are mostly five hundred dollars per month. Um, I think those give kind of a in in insufficient understanding or or misconception of what UBI would look like because UBI actually shouldn't be designed in a way that's like per household and just like one amount. It should scale per amount of members of the household and per kids. So what it would be more more realistically. Is that uh, it would be say you know a thousand dollars per adult, five hundred dollars, uh, four hundred dollars per kid, something like that, and it would scale. So just like there are poverty line scales by number of household by number of members in the household. So you know if what if the poverty line for the number of household members you know is um, what is it like around thirty five thousand dollars for like um, like five people, then that would be like the basic income line. Um, that that household would get across all of those people. And yeah, when it, in regards to um, to how that helps communities, like it's it's really powerful how often we see 
in pilots, just like just this amount of social cohesion increase, how it enables people to get more involved in their communities. Um, it enables people to socialize more, uh, clean up their communities, and again, like create businesses in their communities, especially like in rural areas. Um, there's just so much that just having this income floor can do. Christine? I also want to speak to one piece that I think would be really different with UBI, which is part of the harm of what you're describing, I think, in, in this neighborhood in Cleveland that you brought up is I also think the volatility and unpredictability of income. So when you're just relying on a job um, and especially an unstable relationship with work, a job that has unpredictable hours, um, a job that you may have uh, a tenuous relationship with right in and out of employment, um, that's the additional harm of living under that. A condition, right? It's not knowing how much you're going to make month to month, or you might be making nine thousand dollars a year, but it's one thousand dollars one month and zero months and zero dollars the next. And that in the future, if we expect automation to make that relationship to employment even more tenuous, even more unpredictable, then that additional stress of how people have to navigate the world of really not knowing where, even if it's not enough money, right? Not knowing where that money is coming from next. Um, I think does harm, we know does harm to people's well-being, to their relationships with their kids, to their relationships with one another. It's just such an enormous source of stress when not only do you not have enough money, but it's really unpredictable when you're going to get more. Excellent. We have a couple of questions from the chat. I'm going to ask one question, give you each you know, 30 to 45 seconds to answer that before we turn it over to you for your closing arguments. So one question from the chat is, how does your program change worker or job seeker behavior in a meaningful way? I can talk about this a little bit. Yeah, when I was at the Center for Employment Opportunities, we stood up a cash transfer program during COVID to people coming home from prison and jail. And this is a group of people who typically have really tough times breaking into the workforce and continue to do so for a whole host of reasons, including um, barriers around records. And we just saw amazing things that uh, people could do when they had a little bit less anxiety about when they needed to break into that workforce. And so um, I think evaluation data is still forthcoming on, on this large scale effort that we did during COVID. But anecdotally, some of the things that we saw were people waiting a little longer to get a better job instead of just getting the very first job that came their way out of, their pre out of that pressure to make money immediately. And so I'd be really excited to see how job matching and job and uh, endurance at jobs improve if you can get better matching up front because you're not so stressed about needing to take that first job that comes your way. Um, can you can we end up with um, happier workers, happier employers because they're because they have happier workers showing up um, and just really improving that overall uh, job ma job matching ecosystem. Great. Thank you. Team UBE. Um, again, very quickly, I can't harp enough on that the opportunity to go work in your own community in an environment that doesn't have the same uh, uh, microaggressions, doesn't have the same HR issues that someone can, uh, that you have a boss that understands that my auntie passed away and I should not receive a point because that's not an immediate family member when I need to go attend that funeral is so important for, so, so again, our most vulnerable workers and learners. So being able to go work in the community allows you to build up the soft skills, hard and technical skills in a, in a safe environment for folks that have been void of work for so many years. Um, and I think that can't be underscored enough that, again, working in your own community with folks that understand the work that you are doing, understand that where you're at today and how you can get to the next plateau is, I think is very, very important for job seekers. Excellent. Thanks, Devin. Now we are going to turn to our closing arguments and statements. We'll start with Team UBI. You will have two minutes, and then we will go to Team UBE, who will have two minutes. Okay, the grand finale. No pressure. <laughs> you got this. My way. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just finding my spot in my notes. Okay. Uh, thank you. In this debate, we've argued that UBI is a foundational policy that should exist underneath everyone, regardless of any other program resting on top of it. It's always better to prevent poverty than to treat the results of poverty and the ever-present fear of poverty. We could have started UBI decades ago when productivity growth first decoupled from wages, and instead we saw inequality increase and we watched the social contract fray and we experienced the results of that today. 
as we look ahead to a future with even more with an even more volatile labor market, a new solution is needed, and we believe that solution is UBI. The primary reasons given to not do UBI are mistaken. It's not too costly. It won't encourage laziness, and a well-designed UBI will not spike inflation either. Our opponents haven't succeeded in arguing for universal jobs as being superior to UBI. Jobs can never be truly universal, but income can, cash can. Governments are incredibly effective at distributing income, but they're far less effective at determining what people should be doing for work and then making that a reality. And as we go forward into a more automated future, everyone should be more free to self-determine the work they choose. Many people will create their own jobs and the spending of UBI will create many new jobs. Meanwhile, no one with a disability should have to jump through hoops for survival income, and no child should experience poverty ever for any reason, regardless of what their parents do. UBI is a foundation we need. We should build it so that everyone else, so that everything else we do is firmly supported and people are able to better weather the careers of the future. And the time is now. Thank you, Team UBE. Close us out. Thank you. UBE is a movement to demonstrate what it would mean to shift government investment from reactive responses to a proactive solution that restores agency and dignity back to 40 million Americans that are currently living in poverty. By dignifying historically low wage work and supporting the work that happens in community and on Main Street, we can create economic guarantees that put the residents across this country in position to build vibrant and beautiful neighborhoods. While our friends have laid out the benefits of UBI, we must ask if it's fair to ask our most vulnerable workers, learners, and neighbors to continue to wait for a solution that may never come. Ask them to bet their livelihood, safety, and dignity on a proposition that eight states in our union have already said no to. We here today are earning a salary that covers our needs, wants, savings, and have the privilege to think about blue skies and future states. We get up and go to work every day, but now it's not the right answer for poor people. I ask you to think about them today when judging the strength of these two policy solutions. And I ask you to think if there has ever been a UBI pilot or solution that comes that allows people to freely live off the income provided. The workers and learners I have spent the most time with in the most disinvested community are already attempting to make it work off $500 a month. That's our reality our friends in government, philanthropy, and community development are trying to combat every day. Work works and UBE is the people-centric movement to make work work for all. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> amazing job, both teams. Thank you so much for that. Um, just a wealth of knowledge, a lot of really critical points. Um, the, the judges are gonna tabulate some results. Um, also want those that are viewing, you can right now vote for your most valuable de debater who changed your mind, who gave you more information to think about. Um, go ahead, take your phones out, uh, use that QR code and vote. I do want to also, while you all are doing that, just note uh, another question came in from the chat. And I, I just think this one is really interesting. It was someone who has curiosity around how both UBI and UBE could be effectively integrated, emphasizing the potential synergies between the two policies and addressing the challenges posed by an evolving economy. And so just leave that for, for all of us to think about as we... Uh, tabulate the judge results and you all vote for your MVD. We'll just give it a minute. So our results are in with a score of 179 to 172. Our winning team is the UBI team. And our MVD winner goes to, drum roll, brrr, Scott Santons. Scott Santons. I'll say that everyone was a winner here. Just again, great job. Uh, critical conversation at a very important time. You all did a great job. And I hope that our listeners gained more information both on UBI and UBE. And again, this last question and curiosity that one listener gave was, what does it look like for integration? I think we can all agree that we need new models and that we need to do things a bit differently to help all of our talent that exists across the nation. So with that, thank you all so much for joining us, Scott and Christine and Dr. Herring and Devin. Thank you for all of your time, your wisdom and all the work that you're continuing to do even after this debate. For our audience and our, our partners at Tech Duels and our team at JFF Labs, we thank you so much for joining um, and hope you have a great rest of your day. <laughs>